this subject does not have to be as difficult as society makes it out to be. So first of all, before we get started with our topic at hand, I would like to thank Leah for having us here tonight, as well as the Wallingford community. I am forever grateful. I was a Wallingford resident for many, many, many years until we decided to go house hunting and couldn't find anything in town. So our travels took us up 91 South or 91 North and I now live in Middletown, but we still grocery shop here, bank here. We still do everything here. Uh, so thank you for giving me this warm welcome. Uh, in addition to uh, thanking Tracy and all of you here tonight, I also would like to give a shout out on Zoom to my Medicare mentor. Her name is Tracy O'Brien. So for those of you who are on Zoom, uh, you are going to see her name pop up. And she is here with us tonight because we were expecting quite a crowd of close to 60 attendees. And so it would have been a challenge for me to manage the Zoom and the chat and the questions, and of course be present here for all of you. So she is here with us tonight to answer any questions on Zoom for me. So thank you, Tracy, I truly appreciate that. Before we get started, housekeeping details, uh, please mute yourselves. If Leah hasn't already muted you on Zoom, I would greatly appreciate that. For those of you who are here with me tonight, I provided you with a little postcard and there's a reason for that, which I'll share throughout our time together. My business card is there. Those of you on Zoom will see my business card at the end of the presentation. Uh, but if your need to go is more than your need to know, and what I mean by that is for those of you sitting before me, if you need to use the facilities, the restrooms are out in the hallway. Um, so please feel free to get up and, and help yourself to that. For those of you at home, well, you can freely use your bathroom of choice at your, at your <laughs> destination. So Leah, is there anything you would like to share before we go ahead and get started? No, just bear with us for any tech issues and uh, let me know if anything's wrong in the chat. Yeah, or so, yell at me here. <laughs> so this week is actually National Medicare Education Week. So I specifically chose this week when reaching out to Leah to ask if I can provide education and information to the Wallingford community. And as she mentioned, this is our very first live seminar since COVID. And not only are we live in person, but we're also doing a hybrid with Zoom. So please forgive us. Don't be too hard on us. Don't throw tomatoes at us. We're doing the best we can. And in fact, you're actually going to be testing my Medicare knowledge tonight because I am not able to see my notes on my slides in order to get the Zoom to work without them seeing my notes. So I am literally talking off the cuff with what I know. And one of those cut topics is what can you talk about for 30 minutes nonstop? Well, it's going to be Medicare. And Medicare is my love language. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. I wanna share my story with all of you. And to your left, you are going to see a picture of what I looked like yesterday. Uh, right out of high school, I went to college to be an x-ray tech. I always wanted to be an x-ray tech since the age of five. I was hired before even taking my boards at a local hospital in Waterbury, where I was a tech there for over 16 years. In addition to being the x-ray tech, I was also the staff receptionist. And this is where my soft spot for the Medicare community came to light. And whenever I would ask a patient for their insurance card, specifically Medicare, all of a sudden this glazed look would come over them in this state of confusion. And instead of it focusing on Medicare, they were medi confused. And so I really felt bad for the Medicare beneficiaries. And so from that point on, I really tried to do whatever I could at that point was what I knew to help simplify the process. Well, growing up, I went to home parties with my mother. I was the little helper when she did her Avon parties or Sarah Coventry parties. And it was that desire that wanted me to pursue being my own boss. I wanted the flexibility of my time. So I left my x-ray career and went into the direct selling field which I enjoyed that lifestyle for another 16 years, even though I'm still 16 years young right now. So with that being said, it was during the tail end of my direct selling career 
where I really truly appreciated the flexibility of my time. And the reason being is four years ago, my mother was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So not only was I familiar with Medicare back in the medical days, but now I was becoming familiar with Medicare from having my mother go through treatments and such. And so during my radiology, uh, my uh, direct selling career, it afforded me the opportunity to take care of her before she passed away three years ago. And so with that being said, I was on a mission to live out uh, having a voice, not only for my mother and what she inspired me, but to help simplify the process for all of you. So you're going to notice our, throughout our time together that my slides and my logo are specifically the color purple. And that is to represent pancreatic cancer. So thank you for hearing my story and giving me the opportunity to be here with all of you tonight. So turning 65 is a really big deal. It's supposed to be a day of celebration, pomp and circumstance, some cake, some friends, some family. But right around the three month mark before your 65th birthday, you start scratching your head like this young man in the photo because you're overwhelmed with the amount of phone calls you receive, with the amount of mail that comes in, it's enough to kill a few trees. And then of course the TV commercials. Well, I can share with you that here tonight, I am not going to throw a football at you and I am not going to scream, I'm dynamite. I know I'm dynamite, but I'm not a paid celebrity endorsement sharing Medicare information with all of you. I am here, right here in the good old state of Connecticut, talking off my cup, because again, uh, I have no notes in front of me, so I'm speaking from the heart. And so one of, um, actually quite a few of my clients reach out to me and ask, is there any way that you can help me go through the mail? And so they will save their mail in a brown paper bag, and I am able to go through it with them and let them know what's legitimate and what's not legitimate. And the other thing is, please be careful of the phone calls you receive. My public service announcement to all of you here and for those of you at home is Medicare and Social Security will never ask you for your personal information. And this is really relevant when you have family members who have onset early dementia, they are sitting there at home watching TV, seeing a 1-800 number blasted at them calling for information thinking that whatever they're hearing on TV is the next best thing and they get squirrely syndrome, want to call the number, and next thing you know, their plan has been changed, unbeknownst to them and unbeknownst to you. So just please protect your uh, family, your friends, and, and just be careful who you're giving your information to. So speaking of information, I am on a mission here tonight to help you clear your muddy waters. And so tonight we are going to cover what is Medicare. We're going to touch upon a little bit of social security, your eligibility and enrollment into Medicare, the cost of Medicare, understanding your Medicare choices, prescription drug coverage, and even the donut hole. And I'm not talking about Neil's donuts either extra help, and then what's next? So what is Medicare? Well, as we know, it's a federal insurance program that began back in 1966 under the Social Security Administration, and it is now administered by an acronym known as CMS, which actually stands for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. It is made of two parts, Part A and Part B, Part A is your hospital coverage, Part B is your medical coverage. And we'll be getting into further details about both of those parts in just a few moments. However, back in 2018, they changed your Medicare number, which used to be your social security number with an A after it. They changed it to a number that's comprised of letters and numbers. So if you are still walking around with a card that is your social security number, please re reach out to Social Security by calling the number on the screen and let them know that you need a replacement card because any medical provider is not going to accept your Medicare card that has your Social Security number on it. And for those of you who are tech savvy and you love the computer, you can also pay a visit to ssa.gov, which is Social Security's website. 
So who is eligible for Medicare? Well, first of all, you have to be a United States citizen or a legal resident who lived in the US for at least five consecutive years. You also need to be aging in at 65 or have a qualifying disability of at least two years for anyone under 65. Perhaps you have end-stage renal disease, which is a kidney disorder. And then last, we have ALS, which is known as Lou Gehrig's disease. I want to share a story with all of you. I love to share stories. These are real life stories that I can share. And I had a client refer to me just a couple of months ago. And he is of Medicare age, but he's still choosing to continue to work. However, his wife is not 65. She's 62. And unfortunately, she was recently diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease. So you would think, Lou Gehrig's disease, right? It's one of the qualifying situations where she can go on Medicare. Unfortunately, she was a domestic engineer, which means a stay-at-home mom, and she does not personally have the work credits in order to get disability. The only thing that would have helped her is if she did have the work credits, the two-year waiting period would have been waived. But in this situation, she did not have the work credits, and the only way she can go on Medicare is when she ages in at 65. So it's an unfortunate situation and I want all of you to be aware, you know, for hoops and giggles, create yourself an ssa.gov account and just go in or if you have children and grandchildren who are working, have them go in and check their work history. You know, social your social security benefit is based on your highest 35 years of earning. And so by the time you may or may not realize if there's a discrepancy with your years of earning, who keeps their W-2s, right? So please go ahead and create an account or encourage your loved ones to do that and check their work history as well as, you know, perhaps if they're older in their 40s, 50s, and early 60s, do they have enough credits where if they were to become disabled, they would be able to go on Medicare before 65? In addition to being a licensed insurance agent, I am also a National Social Security Advisor Certificate Holder. Uh, one, yes, do you have a question? Yes. Um, no, when it comes to disability, you need your own work history. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. So thank you for that. So the question was, you know, can she claim her husband's work record for the disability part? And the answer is no, you need your own work credits for disability. So for Medicare, yes, but for disability, no. Hence, it's a federal program. So if you take issue with that, please contact your local representative. We're on a mission to change things one voice at a time, right, everybody? So. So as I was stating, I am a, a National Social Security Advisor Certificate Holder. And a lot of times when I meet Medicare beneficiaries such as yourselves out in public, there's a huge uh, confusion thinking Medicare and Social Security are one and the same. And people will come up to me and say something like this. Well, I'm still working. I'm turning 65 and I'm still working. So I don't need to go on Medicare because my Social Security full retirement age is 66 and change. There is truth to that. However, you only have one initial enrollment period aging in to Medicare at 65. And if you don't know the proper steps to take in that situation, you could be faced with a penalty if you're not, you know, if you don't have the proper steps in place, which we'll cover here tonight. Um, so I just want to be certain you are all aware that even though you go through Social Security to enroll in Medicare, they are really two separate entities. So when it comes to Social Security, do you know your full retirement age? It is dependent on your date of birth. And so uh, if you were born in 1960, your full retirement age is going to be 67. You can start collecting your benefit as early as 62, but just know that if you do decide to turn on your benefit uh, before, before your full retirement age, from 62 during that time frame, you are going to be faced with a permanent reduction. And so if you're in a situation where perhaps you do have a stay-at-home wife 
who is going to be dependent on your social security benefit, whether it be a spousal benefit or the widower's benefit, and you take it early, it is a permanent reduction that is going to affect your spouse as well. So just to be certain you are aware of the entire situation. And then if you are to, continuing to choose to work, do you know that there is what's called an annual earnings test? So from the age of 62 to the year before your full retirement age, if you make $18,960, that is the amount that you can earn in that year. But for any amount over that, Social Security will end up taking $1 for every two that you're over the $18,960. The other caveat to that is for the year that you do return, uh, turn your full retirement age, uh, that 18,000 jumps up to 50,520. And so in that situation for every dollar, you know, for every amount you go over, they will take $1 for every three that you're over. And if you end up turning your full retirement age halfway through the year, then there's an actual monthly limit that they take a look at as well. And I just share that with you so you're in the know, like knowledge is power. And once you do hit your full retirement age, if you want to work, there is no annual earnings test here income at that point. You can just go make as much money as you'd like. All right. However, when you do reach your full retirement age, if you decide not to turn on your benefit, you actually will earn an 8% um, increase. It's called a delayed retirement credit. You earn an additional 8% each year up to the age of 70. So if you're in a situation where Perhaps you have a pension, a retirement fund, whatever that looks like, and you're not in a position where you have to turn on your benefit, just know that the longer you delay up to age 70 after your full retirement age, you will earn uh, some additional income. But it's just worth playing it out and just going into your SSA.gov account and seeing what exactly is um, that increase. Because if it's a matter of a couple dollars, you know, enjoy your money now, as they say. And so again, just quickly, some things to consider if you do decide to turn on your social security benefit early, you know, how is your health? What is your expectation of longevity? Um, do you have any money saved, whether it be in a personal savings account, pension, or a 401k? Are you married? As I mentioned, you may, you, you may be interfering with a spousal benefit if you do turn it on early. And then no, you know, uh, as far as do you have a spouse or, or children who could possibly collect off of your benefit? And do you have anyone in the house under the age of 18 or are they in college? These are some, some factors to consider if you do choose to turn on your benefit early. There's also, uh, here's the chart for your, your full retirement age. And so anyone born between 43 and 54, your full retirement age is the age 66. For every year after, you'll see that the benefit, the full retirement age jumps up in increments of two months. As of right now, on 1960, if you were born there, your full retirement age is 67. And I know that Social Security has been making the news as of late uh, because of the fact COVID has put a financial pinch on the trust fund. And they say by 2034, it might be uh, paid out 70 to 75% of the benefit as opposed to what you're receiving now. Yes, they are going to have to make some changes. Does it mean it's going to be absolutely depleted? No, but there's been talk for quite a while of them raising the full retirement age anyway. That's just one of the factors that they would consider to help us um, add more money, so to speak, into the pot. And so uh, stay tuned on that one, everyone. All right. So how Social Security and Medicare work together? Well, as I mentioned, you do need to connect with Social Security in order to enroll in Medicare. And there's going to be a Part A and a Part B premium, and it's Social Security that deems what those premiums are going to be. And so that is essentially how they do work together. And uh, if in the event, and we'll be covering premiums in just a moment, uh, but know that for Part A, as long as you or and or your spouse have worked at least 10 years or 40 quarters, you are most likely receiving Part A 
um, with a no cost premium. You've paid your way through it with that Medicare tax coming out every week, you, re, you um, were paid. And so you most likely may not have a premium for part day. However, if you are less than 10 years or 40 quarters, you are going to have a premium for Part A, and it could be as up to as high as $400 and change a month. Um, so I have not seen anyone who has had to have to pay for Part A, but it is a possibility out there. And then, of course, we have Part B, which everyone pays a premium for, and I'll be covering that in just a moment. All right, so we have original Medicare. As I said, Part A is paid with your income tax. Part B is the what is going to be um, charged to you. And the baseline amount for that is $148.50 a month. That is the baseline. And there are certain income levels for that. And so with that being said, if your income, in just a moment, I am going to introduce you to a really nasty woman and her name is Aunt Irma. We don't like Aunt Irma. She is not a nice lady and she doesn't play nice in the sandbox. And so your Part B premium could go up if you made more money than the minimum amount that they allow for the 148.50. So I will share that with you in just a moment. So this is the chart. IRMA stands for Income Related Monthly, Adjust, uh, Monthly Adjusted Amount. And so let's take a look at the left column. As a single individual tax filer for this year, if your income uh, from two years ago, and what I wanna say is your Part B premium always has a two year look back period. So for 2021, if you are turning 65, they are going to be looking at your income, your adjusted gross income from 2019. So as an individual tax filer, if you were $88,000 or less, you will be paying the baseline of 148.50. But if your income was more than that, whether it be single or a married couple, as you can see to the far right, that is what the surcharge will be for your Part B premium. So it jumps from 148.50 to 207.90 to $297 to $386.10, $475.20, and it can go as high as $504.90. Um, I do have a couple of clients who are in that $500 range. And instead of being them being mad, they're just thankful that they were able to live in this country and be able to live their American dream and make it what they had. So they don't have a problem paying for that. And I say, that's awesome. I do wanna make mention that there is also a part D surcharge. And I just want you to remember D for drugs. Your part D prescription drug plan, if your income falls in those higher ranges, you are also going to have a surcharge for your Part D premium as well. One thing I wanted to share with you is if you are collecting Social Security, they are going to take your Part D premium and your Part D surcharge directly from your Social Security check. But if you're not collecting Social Security, they will mail you a bill. You will receive a paper bill in the mail for at least three months of premium. So when you get a bill for over $500, I don't want you to stroke out on me. It is for three months of premium, rather have it being a monthly deduction that is withdrawn from your social security benefit. Now, one thing I wanted to share is, let's just say two years ago you were married and your adjusted amount is based on you're married and perhaps you're paying $297 a month, and that is per person. This is not a couple. If you're coming off employer coverage, employer coverages have the family plan. Medicare doesn't offer the family plan. It's per person, it's an individual basis. So with your Part B premium, and I'm losing my train of thought, so it's going to come back to me. And so I just wanted to share with you, uh, it is, oh, okay, I remember where I was going. So they always do a two year look back. And so if two years ago you were married, but unfortunately now two years forward, you're not, you're a widow, you're single, whatever that is. You are able to appeal your premium if you choose with social security for a life situation, a life you know, extenuating circumstance. 
I can't guarantee you're going to win that appeal, but you know what? It's worth a try. I would say the squeaky wheel gets the oil. If you ever need any help with that, let me know. But you are able to uh, appeal your Part B premium if you are paying a higher amount and something in life has changed. So that is your Part B and your Part D. Yes. It's every two years. So you actually, and that's a great question, that your Part B and D surcharge may fluctuate based on your income every two years back. Is that included? Whatever you're filing on your income tax. Mm -hmm. Yes. I get mine automatically going into my bank. So I don't know. What they're taking. I mean, you know, like, is it like, like, part of the thing? I don't know if I even, if I even have that. You would take a look at your social security statement. So I would say, dig out your, in order to do your taxes, they have to, by right, send you a social security statement and it will give you an itemized description as to what is coming out of your benefit. Okay. Now, if your income is at the lower threshold, there's a program in the state of Connecticut called the Medicare Savings Program. And the limits for Connecticut are pretty much some of the higher, highest limits we have in the country. And so as a single individual person, if your monthly income is below $2,600 a month, you could be eligible for this program if you're not already on it. And the state of Connecticut actually pays your Part B premium for you. And then there's another limit of 3,500 and change for a married couple for a month. It's income on a monthly basis. So if you think you might qualify for that, you have my business card. And for those of you on Zoom, you'll see my business card info at the end. Reach out to me and I'm more than happy to see if you might be eligible for that program. Someone just asked if we could repeat the question that was asked. She said, uh, the question was, she does not know what is being deducted out of her social security benefit. She has no idea. So I encouraged her and all of you to go to ssa.gov and take a look at your statement or go back and look at your statement that was mailed to you by social security. And they will give you an itemization as far as exactly what comes out of your social security benefit. And thank you for that question. So as we shared, Medicare is your fabulous red, white, and blue card. And I apologize for whatever reason when we're on Zoom, my graphics are not wanting to come up. So I apologize. So I'm going to be visual and descriptive here. So the reason why you do not want Medicare, the red, white, and blue card by itself, and this is what I love to educate everyone on, is that Medicare Part A has deductibles and co-pays, which I'm going to break down for you in a moment, but it's Part B that you they only pay 80% and you're responsible for 20% and it's really 20% of the sky. There's no financial stop loss at all when it comes to Medicare. This is why you want to supplement it with something, whether it be an employer plan, whether it be a Medicare supplement or a Medicare Advantage plan you need to have something to cover that because the number one reason why people have to file bankruptcy is for medical costs. And so what I mean by that, and here's the chart, and, and I'm going to draw you a visual. If you had a $100 bill from the doctors, you would be responsible for $20. If you had a $1,000 bill, you're going to be responsible for $200. If you had a $100,000 bill, which we know is not difficult to get to with the cost of medicine and visits and such, your responsibility is $20,000. Are we in a situation where we can cover that? I, if you are, okay. But just know that one out of every two men are diagnosed with cancer and one out of every three women are diagnosed with cancer. And if God forbid we end up with that diagnosis, that could be a charge that you're looking at. And I don't wanna see you catastrophically destroyed uh, because of medical costs. All right, so we have Medicare Part A. 
Medicare Part A is your room and board. It covers your hospital stays, inpatient, skilled nursing, and hospice. You must be admitted to the hospital. So if you end up in the emergency room and you're held in observation, that is a Part B charge, not Part A. When it comes to Part A, it's funny, I, I kind of make light of it, um, but they don't cover the TV and they don't cover the phone. So if you need to phone a friend, you better bring your cell phone. <laughs> That's all I have to say. For part A, there is a deductible and you're going to notice on the screen, it's a $1,484 per benefit period deductible. That does not say annual deductible. So what does that mean? You're admitted to the hospital today, you're discharged five days later, and all of a sudden, 63 days later, you end up back admitted to the hospital. That means you have a new deductible of $1,484 to meet. If you are readmitted less than that, you're now going to enter that copay stage, which is $352 a day, or, uh, and again, I apologize um, for whatever, when we switch to Zoom, some of my slides are not coming up uh, or some of the information. You also have 60 lifetime reserve days after the 90th day. So if you've used up your lifetime reserve days, you don't get any more lifetime reserve days. You end up being a cash out of pocket situation. So um, I know this is why we need to find a way to cover this. And so now let's talk about part B. Part B is where we said your monthly premium would be $148.50 per person. You might be subject to IRMA if your income is higher than the limits we talked about. And you could also be faced with a late enrollment penalty if you do not enroll when you are supposed to. And I say that loosely. With Part B, there's also a $203 deductible for 2021. Notice I put the date in there because Rumor has it, for those on Social Security, you're getting a raise this year. I hope you understand and feel that I live the raw of real realness with all of you and those of you at home. I say it the way it is. It might be $203 for this year, but it probably will not be that for next year. And we don't know those totals, you know, the, the value of that until about end of October, early December. I'm sorry, end of October, early November. So just stay tuned for that. And I don't wanna be the bearer of bad news. I want you to enjoy your raise, but the money that you're getting will probably go in one hand and out the other with what the Medicare increases will be. And don't kill the messenger. You're also responsible for 20% of your Medicare approved charges for part B with there's no stop loss as we talked about. So part B are your doctor visits, x-rays, blood work, physical therapy, ambulance, you name it. If it's not an inpatient situation, it's covered under Part B. All right, there we go. So what does Medicare not cover? As I said, um, TV and phone. Also, you're out of pocket with no limit as we talked about. It also does not cover long-term care. So anything past 100 days in a skilled nursing facility becomes a long-term care situation. If you do not have a long-term care policy in place, I highly encourage you to seek out the advice of a financial professional if that's something you are interested in. If they also do not cover dental, vision, or hearing, eyeglasses, contacts, or hearing aids. So I know. <laughs> They're laughing at me over here, but uh, they're laughing with me and not at me. Um, also, the excess charges by doctors who do not accept Medicare assignment. So if you don't know what that means, what that means is if you don't, if you go to see a primary or any type of physician and they do not accept assignment, basically they'll accept what Medicare pays, but then they can turn around and balance bill you for the rest. Whereas if they accept assignment, then they have to accept what Medicare pays and it stops there. You'll notice that prescription, uh, prescription drug coverage is not a part of Medicare as well. So if you're just wanting to stick with original Medicare, you do need to add on a standalone drug plan to that coverage. It is not covered. 
And then of course, any care received outside of the United States, except under certain circumstances. And I would love for you to, if you're an app person, for those of you here or at home, I would love for you to download the app, medicare.gov, because you're actually able to see, like if you're going for a test and you wanna see if it's a, a Medicare approved charge, you just go onto the app and type it in and it'll tell you exactly if it's a Medicare approved charge or not. And if in the event that, you know, the test, whatever it is that you're having done doesn't come up, ask your provider for what's called a CPT code. C is in Charlie or CAP, P is in Peter, T is in Tom. Ask for the code and reach out to Medicare and say, I have this CPT code. Can you please tell me if this is a covered service? So now let's talk about enrollment periods. Uh, the one we've been focusing on is the one where you are aging in at the age of 65. It's called your initial enrollment period. This is where you take your three months before your 65th birthday, the month of and three months after. You only get one shot at this. You're only turning 65 once in your lifetime. So if you do not enroll in Medicare during this time, you need to know the proper steps to take before you end up with paying a penalty. I encourage you to focus on the three months before and not in the month of, not the three months after, because if you end up enrolling three months after, you could end up with a delay in your coverage. And I don't wanna have you um, have to go through that. If you do miss your chance to enroll, then you would end up in the general enrollment period where you can enroll in Medicare during January, February, or March, but your coverage would not take effect until July 1st. And then the one that's coming up, which is big, is the annual enrollment period. And that is from October 15th to December 7th. This is where anyone and everyone on Medicare can enroll in a plan. You want to find an agent who is going to review your prescription drug coverage, that's the most important, as well as letting you know if your doctors are still taking your plan for next year because I've seen it over and over in the years that I've provided Medicare services to my clients. And that is doctors come on and off a plan and medications come off and on a formulary or they change tiers, which means your price is going to change. So you need to have a review of your benefits, even if you're happy with where you're at, that's great, but you need to be in the know. And so if you're not having a benefit review, I'd be more than happy to provide that service to you. My services are complimentary. However, you after tonight have to reach out to me. It is not compliant for me to reach out to you. So if you wish to pick my brain at any time, please feel free to call me, email me, and I'm happy to answer your questions. So now there are also some extenuating circumstances which we call a special enrollment period. You could be eligible for a lifelong special enrollment period if you are currently on Medicaid or the Medicare Savings Program, if you are part of the Pharmaceutical Assistance Program, if you are chronically ill or have a disability and receive Social Security benefits, or you are enrolled in a special needs plan. There are some other qualifying situations where you would be able to enroll outside of your normal enrollment period. And that is number one, let's just say you relocated here from another state, you're new to the state of Connecticut. You're on a Medicare plan, the plan you're on will not work here. So you need to change plans. You only have a two month window of time in order to make that change. Otherwise you might be locked out and we don't wanna see that happen. Let's just say you've lost employer coverage. All of a sudden you retire unexpectedly or you're in, you know, involuntarily terminated, whatever that means. Now you're in a situation where you need to find a plan. The other is if you are moving in and out of a, a type of nursing facility, we call it an institution that could apply to someone you know, <coughs> excuse me, or if you've lost Medicaid or your Medicare savings program coverage, you are also given another enrollment period, or perhaps you've left prison. Applies to Martha, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> so let's talk about Part A and how do you enroll. If you are currently collecting social security, you are automatically going to be enrolled in Medicare. 
they will send you your card about two to three months before your 65th birthday. However, if you are not collecting Social Security, you now need to ask yourself, are you contributing to an HSA? An HSA is a health savings account. You need to stop making contributions to your HSA at least six months before you're ready to enroll in Medicare. I, it's not a ruling that we came up with. It has to do with the pre-tax dollars that you would be using. You're allowed to use it for co-pays and deductibles. You are not allowed to use it to pay a premium. So you have to stop making those contributions. Any questions on that, I advise you to seek a tax professional and they'll be able to let you know what that means for your specific situation. But otherwise, remember part A, you most likely do not have to pay a premium for. So if you're not contributing to an HSA, I say go ahead and roll in part A. It's not going to cost you anything in premium, even if you're choosing to continue to work and you're staying on employer coverage. It's part B where you're going to have some choices. If you're collecting Social Security, you will automatically be enrolled in B. But if you are still continuing to work after the age of 65, and I'll cover this in a, in a slide in just a moment, as long as your coverage from work, and I just had this conversation with a client in the car before I walked into the library, and that is he is on his wife's plan. The wife's plan is considered creditable coverage with her job. So he is not going to take part B because remember you have to pay a premium for B and you're also paying a premium for the employer plan. Why do you wanna pay for the same thing essentially twice? So he is choosing to delay his part B enrollment because he's covered under his wife. And so as long as he knows the right steps to take when she goes to retire, he will avoid paying a penalty. If you do need to enroll in Medicare because of the fact you're not collecting Social Security, you have one of two ways to do this right now. Create an account at ssa.gov and look for, scroll down and look for the Medicare enrollment box on the lower right side, or you would reach out to Social Security and schedule a phone enrollment appointment. They are not taking in-person appointments right now due to COVID, so your only option is to create an account or by giving them a call. So here is why you may want to uh, delay part B or what you would do in that situation. So if you are working past the age of 65, you would, as long as your employer has 20 or more employees and the coverage is considered creditable and she worked for enterprise, um, so, she is fine. It actually stated right in her bylaws that their, their coverage is considered creditable, so he can delay Part B. But let's just say this person's employer didn't have 20 employees. Well, now you're going to have to enroll in Medicare because Medicare will come into play and most likely end up being the primary insurance with your employer coverage if you're choosing to keep it, being the secondary. One thing I love to do for my clients is compare apples to apples to apples. I have them get their employer coverage. What are you paying for a premium? What are you paying for co-pays? And what is your deductible? And comparing that to a Medicare supplement and a Medicare Advantage plan. I've had actually people come to me begging to get them on Medicare because they are on a high deductible plan with their job to the tune of about $67,000 a year. They're like begging me. Whereas the other side of that, perhaps you work for the state and you don't need to um, change coverage. You can stay on your employer plan for now, unless you choose to go elsewhere. All right, if you do choose to delay your Part B, you do need to know that there are two forms that you will need to fill out. And this is what I explained to the gentleman tonight. When you know that your wife is done and she's ready to retire, I need for you to reach out to me about two to three months before because I need to provide him these two forms. One is for him to fill out. The other is for his employer to fill out. He will then take these forms, send them off to Social Security. In the lower right, uh, on the right side, that form down below where you see remarks, this is where you'll write in physically when you want your Part B to go into effect. 
So if she was retiring December 31st, you would write in there to please put my Part B in effect for January 1st of 2022. You just need to know, and here's another story I want to share with you. I met an individual a couple of years ago, and he was retiring. He was offered a golden handshake from his job. The golden handshake consisted of him getting a year's worth of benefits as part of his package. He got to enjoy life one day and have a year's worth of benefits the next. Well, unfortunately, they didn't relay the message that he only had eight months from when he retired to get Part B without paying a penalty. So you have to enroll in Part B from either when your job ended or when your benefits ended, whichever one came first. So it won't matter if they offered you a year's worth of benefits, you have to enroll in Part B from when your job ended. Okay? I just want to put that out there. And speaking of late enrollment penalties, I would just not to be the bearer of bad news. It doesn't affect a lot of people, but I need to keep you in the know because that is my mission for all of you here tonight. So part A, if you didn't enroll when you were supposed to and not have the proper procedure in place, you could be looking at a 10% penalty. For part B, it's the same thing. It's a 10% penalty for each 12 full 12 month period that you were delayed. And then for prescription drug coverage, I hear this one a lot. I have people come up to me and say, well, I don't take any prescriptions. So why do I need to pay for something I don't use? I wish that was the case, but if you go without a prescription drug plan for more than 63 days, you are going to pay 1% multiply times the national average, which is $33.06, times 1% for each month you did not have coverage. So if you went 12 months without coverage, it's the 1% times the 33.06 times 12%. And that is the penalty that you will have every single month. And the only way to make that go away is if you did qualify for extra help with the state of Connecticut. Otherwise you are going to pay that penalty. So what are your options to supplement original Medicare with? So I want you to pretend for those of you at home and those of you in front of me, you know, pretend you have an original Medicare card at the top of your paper. Right in the middle is your Medicare card. You have one line going down to the left, one line going down to the right. You have on one side what's called a Medicare supplement, and that is where original Medicare is your primary, your A and your B. And now you're going to add a supplement or what we call a Medigap plan to that. That would be your secondary. And the secondary will pay whatever Medicare doesn't as long as it's a Medicare approved charge. Okay, so if Medicare didn't approve it, the secondary isn't paying either. You also add, need to add a drug plan to that side as well, because remember Medicare does not offer a prescription drug plan. So you need to add that drug plan to that as well. So what are some pros and cons to this side? A pro is there's no doctor network. So you can be seen by any physician anywhere in the United States as long as they accept original Medicare. You also have very little to no monthly, uh, no co-pays, depending on the plan. Some have co-pays very low, some have none. The other con is you pay a higher monthly premium for it. So it's going to be a pay me now or pay me later situation. So this one has a higher monthly premium, but if you're someone who sees a doctor a couple times a month and has serious health issues, your responsibility is paying your premium, meaning your $203 deductible. And if you've ever met a friend or family member who have said, well, I don't pay anything. Well, they're probably talking about this side. They pay their premium, they've met your $203 deductible, and as long as it's a Medicare approved charge, nine times out of 10, you don't get a bill in the mail. So as long as if you're the type of person who is going to worry at night and wonder about what if, this may be the side that you want to consider as long as your budget allows for you to pay that monthly premium. You also need to know it does not include any dental, any vision, or any hearing. So if you want those services, you would need to purchase a standalone policy. To, the, to what you have on that side as well. So on that left side, you have part A and you have part B and you have part D. 
feels like alphabet soup or cookie monster. I want you to squish them all together and roll them into a ball and move it to the other side, which is known as part C, and that is Medicare Advantage. And that is what you see advertised all over TV. So here are some pros and cons to that. It has a doctor network, so you need to play nice in the sandbox. So they have HMOs and PBOs. Most people coming off an employer plan are used to this anyway. You also have very little to no monthly premium. However, you may have a deductible with your plan and you are going to have co-pays for every service you touch. Some of these plans have some dental, some vision and some hearing, and they're also going to have for the most part, there's a couple that don't, but that's a perfect plan for a veteran. Your prescription drug plan premium is covered. It's embedded into the plan. You would have to pay the co-pays for the cost of your prescriptions. So at the end of the day, those are your two choices outside of an employer plan. And what dictates this is your drugs and your doctors and your dollars. So the, I call it the four Ds, you know, your drugs, doctors, dollars, decide, you know, and you do have to follow certain enrollment periods for each of these situations. And I, Medicare is not a cookie cutter situation, my friends. Everyone's situation is unique. So when you have friends and family who tell you, I'm on the best plan, I'm sure they are for them but you're all different, you all have different medical circumstances and you all have different medications. So what works for one person may not work for someone else. So it's very important you get your own review and see what is best for you. We love our friends and family, right? <laughs> so here's just a side-by-side -side scenario. I'll just let you take a gander at this. This is for, of course, your zip code. 06492. I know that one by the, my, uh, my, off the top of my head for living here for so long. And so we have supplements on one side, and then we have Medicare Advantage on the other. Uh, I am not at the liberty to discuss co-pays and such, just because that would make this a sales event. And we are strictly educational here tonight. So if you are wanting to continue a conversation, that's specific and customized to you, then please fill out that card, leave it behind. For those of you at home, I will be uh, showing my email and phone number in just a moment for you to reach out to me after tonight as well. So now let's talk about donuts. And I'm not talking about Neil's donuts down the street. Yes. During the annual enrollment period, you could switch as many times as you want. And what happens is the last plan that you enrolled in as of midnight on December 7th is the one that you will end up with on January 1st. Can you repeat her question? The question is they wanted to know about annual enrollment and about switching. And so um, I basically share, you can share, you can enroll, like if you were to go to every carrier seminar that's out there, because I know this year there were over 30 Medicare Advantage plans, you could change and enroll every time you went to a seminar. You just need to realize whatever the last plan is for you at midnight on December 7th is the one you will end up with as of January 1st. And for those on a Medicare Advantage plan, you will have another enrollment period through the months of January, February, and March, where you are allowed a one-time opportunity to change your plan for the rest of the next year. No, can the state of Connecticut is a guaranteed issued state. They asked if we needed to show proof of insurability and the answer is no. And I mean, we need to see your previous insurance card, but that's about it. Very little underwriting at all. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions before we finalize our evening together? Yes. Um, so I'm a retired teacher. Congratulations. Thank you for your service. The teacher's retirement fund? Yes. 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 Yeah. 
So please feel free to reach out to me. I'm going to be honest. Um, I am knowledgeable about it. I have some clients who have opted to come off the teacher retirement fund and then some that have chosen to stay based on their situation. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So let's just put a wrap, a bow tie on a couple more slides and we'll end our time together. So as far as the donuts, I'm referring to the donut hole in prescription drug coverage. There are four stages to a prescription drug plan. The first stage is what we call the deductible. Most plans have a deductible of $445 for 2021. However, for 2022, that will be going up to $480. So what does that mean? There are five tiers to medications. Tiers one and two are generic, tiers three and four are brand name, and tiers five are your specialty drugs. The deductible nine times out of 10 is only applicable to drugs that are in tiers three, four, and five. So if you are on generic, the deductible will not apply to you. So you'll immediately go to the second stage, which is that initial coverage stage. And basically what that means is copay. Otherwise, deductible means it's the amount that you have to pay out of pocket, which is the retail cost of the medicine until your deductible has been fulfilled. And then you go to the second stage. And the second stage is known as initial coverage. And this is where you as the member have a copay and the insurance carrier pays their portion of the retail cost. So it's a combination of what you pay and what they pay. That amount for this year is $4,130. However, for 2022, it is going up to $4,430. When between what you pay and they pay reaches that amount, you will now end up in the infamous donut hole, which is known as the coverage gap. In this situation, it's where you go from paying a flat copay to 25% of the cost of the medication. And you are going to stay in this stage until your true out of pocket reaches $6,550 for this year. When you do reach that amount, you will end up in the last stage, which is known as catastrophic. And that is where your price goes from 25% down to 5%. I wanna also let you know that for 2022, that $6,550 will be increased to $7,050. Here are some ways that you can keep your costs down. Generic, are you using a preferred pharmacy? Every carrier has a preferred pharmacy, which means you're paying the lowest copay that you possibly can with that pharmacy. So are you using your preferred pharmacy? Are you... Uh, are you on a medication that your doctor prescribed and maybe it's not on the formulary? And the word formulary means a list of approved medications. Your doctor could be asking and writing out to the, reaching out to the carrier for a prior authorization, uh, for a formulary exception. There's steps that we can take to help get these medicines covered. One thing that I pride myself on is I have helped many clients fill out patient assistance, pharmaceutical program applications for the big name carriers, Novo Nordisk and Bristol Myers Squibb. And recently I've been able to get their medications such as Eliquis and Ozempic for them absolutely free. So if you have anyone in that situation, I would love the opportunity. And I just hope that you feel my sincerity when I say I don't go the extra mile for my clients. I'm willing to walk the extra 10 to help you get what it is that you need. We also have the five-star uh, program, so to speak, with Medicare Advantage plans and prescription drug plans. And a lot of times I get asked, how in the world could these carriers offer a zero premium plan? Medicare Advantage plans and prescription drug plans are offered through private health insurance companies. The word insurance means transfer of risk. Medicare is a federal insurance program. The federal government wants to transfer the risk of them being the payer 
to the private health insurance companies. These carriers, these plans are given a star rating based on customer feedback. The higher the star rating, the more funds the government throws at these plans to offer these benefits. And that is why they are able to offer what it is that they do. And Medicare Advantage plans have to offer the same, if not more services, um, and it has to be comparable to Medicare. You just have to follow a network if you're on a Medicare Advantage plan. Here are some financial programs to be of assistance to you. We have the extra help, and that is for your prescriptions. Uh, again, if you do qualify for extra help, these enrollments and uh, coverage gap do not apply. Uh, the extra help would help take care of that. We also have Medicaid, which is income and asset based. Uh, so we have that here in the state, and that varies from state to state as far as the income allowed and the assets. We have the Medicare Savings Program. So as I mentioned throughout our time together, as a single individual, if your monthly income is below $2,600, and if it's a married couple, it's below $3,500, you could be eligible for this program and not even realize it. And then we also have the program called PACE. So here are some questions to ask yourself as we approach the upcoming enrollment period. How often do you see your doctor? Are your medications covered? Do you have a particular doctor, hospital, or pharmacy that you want to use? Because there are some carriers here in the state that don't necessarily cover certain doctors and hospital networks. Do you have other health insurance coverage from your employer or perhaps the military? So these are just some considerations. And remember when I said it's a pay me now or pay me later situation? That's what it's going to come down to. Are you wanting to pay a higher monthly premium with a supplement for very little to no copay throughout the year? Or would you rather be a risk taker, not pay a monthly premium and have copays as you go? And those plans do have a max out of pocket. So if God forbid, knock on wood, you had an unhealthy year, every time you make a copay, the system keeps track of it. And then you would have, if you reach that max, then the plan would pay 100% for the remainder of that year and then the clock resets every January. As we say, Happy New Year, right? Hmm. So here are the four Ds. Uh, this is my, what I live by. Drugs, doctors, dollars, and decide. You make a decision. And I know I would love the opportunity to help take something off of your plate this upcoming Thanksgiving season. I have those that are eager to meet with me on October 1st to get their plan off the plate. And then I have those that want to wait until December 7th because they're procrastinators. So wherever you fall in there, if you do not have an agent that provides a benefit review, I'd be more than happy to be of service to you. So what's next and why me? I am a local insurance agent here in Connecticut. I have a 203 number. And I can tell you right now, when you dial 203, you will always get me. I am not a 1-800 number. You're not going to be shifted to someone different every time you call. I don't live in another country. I don't throw a football for a living. And I am not going to scream dynamite at you through this computer screen. It's just not happening. I am appointed with most of the carriers here in the state of Connecticut. So I am authentically able to offer you the best plan that is fit for your needs. And then I also, like I said, do benefit reviews for the upcoming year. My clients will tell you that at the end of the day, they don't need to uh, stress. They just need to call Jess because I would rather have them call me than reach out to the carriers and be on hold forever or transferred to somewhere else. So they know that they just need to call me and they're very happy about that. So in the meantime, here is my information. I will leave it up for a moment and then I will open it up to any questions, remaining questions. And I know that I kept you over a few moments while we had some little challenges, but I just wanted, first of all, thank Leah. I want to thank the Zoomers for being here tonight, as well as those of you in my live audience. Thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart, giving me the opportunity to be of service to you. And I hope you would agree that my mission is to help simplify the whole entire process by providing education and information so the muddied waters do not have to be so muddy. So thank you again.